If a person has no kidneys due to a medical condition or surgical removal, they require dialysis to perform the functions that kidneys would normally do, such as filtering waste products and excess fluids from the blood. Dialysis is a medical treatment that comes in two main types. One, hemodialysis. This method uses a machine and a filter to clean the blood outside the body. Blood is drawn out of the body, passed through a filter called a dialyzer, and then returned to the body. Two, peritoneal dialysis. In this method, a cleansing fluid is introduced into the abdomen. The lining of the abdominal cavity acts as a natural filter and waste products are drawn into the fluid, which is then drained from the body. Dialysis is essential for individuals without functioning kidneys to help regulate their body's balance of fluids, electrolytes, and waste products. Without dialysis or a kidney transplant, a person cannot survive without functioning kidneys. Yes, dialysis can be done at home, and many people find it to be a convenient option. There are two types of home dialysis. One, home hemodialysis. Description, this type of dialysis uses a machine to filter and clean your blood, similar to in-center hemodialysis, but it can be done at home. Frequency, it can be performed more frequently than in-center treatments, daily or several times a week, with sessions often being shorter and more flexible in schedule. Training. You and a care partner will need to undergo training to learn how to operate the machine, insert needles, and manage any complications. Equipment. The dialysis machine and supplies will be delivered to your home. Martu. Peritoneal dialysis PD. Description. Peritoneal dialysis uses the lining of your abdomen, the peritoneum, as a natural filter. A special cleansing fluid is inserted into your abdomen through a catheter and waste products are filtered out of the blood through this fluid. Types, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, CAPD, done manually, usually three to four times a day, with each exchange taking about 30 to 40 minutes. Continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis or automated peritoneal dialysis, APD, uses a machine to perform dialysis overnight while you sleep. Flexibility. PD offers flexibility, allowing you to continue daily activities during the day. Benefits of home dialysis. Convenience. No need to travel to a dialysis center. Flexible schedule. You can perform dialysis when it fits your routine. Improved well-being. Frequent dialysis can help reduce symptoms like fatigue and improve your overall quality of life. Considerations. Training. Home dialysis requires training, which can take several weeks to a few months. Support. You might need a partner to help with the treatment, especially in the case of home hemodialysis. Space. You will need a clean, dedicated space to store the equipment and supplies. Medical monitoring. You'll need regular checkups with your healthcare team to monitor your health and adjust your treatment plan as needed. Home dialysis can be a great option for people who want more control over their treatment schedule and are comfortable managing the process at home. However, it requires a commitment to training, cleanliness, and monitoring. If Rob doesn't have a partner to help with home dialysis, there are still several options for him to get the support he needs. One, dialysis care assistance programs. Some dialysis centers offer programs where trained professionals or nurses can visit your home to assist with treatments. This service can be scheduled as needed to help with setting up or monitoring the dialysis process. Two, professional home care services. Rob could hire a professional caregiver or nurse experienced in dialysis. These caregivers can provide both practical assistance with the treatment and emotional support, ensuring that he has a safe and effective dialysis experience at home. Three, automated peritoneal dialysis, APD, this type of peritoneal dialysis uses a machine to do the treatment overnight while Rob sleeps. It's more automated and might require less manual involvement, making it a good choice for people who are managing treatment on their own. Four, telehealth support. Many dialysis providers now offer remote support through telehealth. Rob can connect with healthcare professionals via video calls to get guidance on setting up the equipment, troubleshooting issues, and monitoring his treatment from home. Five, community resources. 
There are support groups and community organizations that provide services for people on home dialysis. These groups may offer volunteers or peer support to assist with the process. Online communities can also be a valuable resource for advice and encouragement. Six, training for independent dialysis. With proper training, it is possible for Rob to learn to manage the dialysis process independently. Many people on home dialysis are able to handle all aspects of their treatment after receiving training from their healthcare team. Seven, support from dialysis center. The dialysis center itself can be a source of ongoing support. They may provide 24-7 phone assistance for any questions or emergencies that arise while performing dialysis at home. Eight, social services and assistance. He might also be eligible for assistance from social services or healthcare programs that can provide funding or support for in-home medical care. While not having a partner can make home dialysis more challenging, there are many resources available to ensure Rob can receive the care and support he needs to manage his treatment safely and effectively. It's difficult to say whether someone's experiences are a result of karma, as that concept varies greatly depending on cultural and personal beliefs. Karma is often understood as the idea that one's actions, whether good or bad, lead to future consequences. If Rob has negative attitudes or actions toward women, it might impact his social connections and relationships, potentially leading to isolation or lack of support in difficult times. However, rather than focusing on whether this situation is a form of karma, it might be more helpful for Rob to reflect on his beliefs and behaviors. By working on building healthier attitudes and relationships with others, he could find more meaningful support and companionship in his life. Personal growth and change are always possible, no matter one's past actions. It seems like Rob has found a group of people who share his views, even if they're negative or adversarial toward both men and women. Sometimes people connect with others based on shared frustrations or dislikes, even if those views are unhealthy or unproductive. While this kind of support can feel validating in the short term, it might not lead to positive changes or fulfilling relationships. If Rob wants to build more constructive connections, it could be beneficial for him to explore different perspectives, work on understanding the root of his negative feelings, and seek out groups or communities that focus on personal growth and empathy. Surrounding oneself with people who encourage positive change can be a more rewarding path in the long run. Ideas about who goes to hell vary widely depending on religious beliefs, spiritual views, and cultural perspectives. Most major religions teach that people's actions, intentions, and how they treat others play a significant role in their afterlife outcome. In some belief systems, forgiveness, redemption, and personal growth are also considered important factors. If you're concerned about Rob and his group, it's worth considering that everyone has the potential to change their attitudes and behavior. Encouraging compassion, understanding, and self-reflection might help them shift their perspective. It's always possible for people to grow and find a more positive path, regardless of where they started. It can be tough to deal with people who seem to be stuck in negative patterns, especially when it feels like they hold on to those emotions. Sometimes, People get caught up in their hurt or bitterness, and it becomes a cycle that's hard to break out of. While it's difficult to change someone's mindset if they're not open to it, there's always hope that over time, experiences or personal reflections might lead them to a different perspective. It's often healthier to focus on your own growth and positivity rather than letting others' negativity pull you down. Staying true to kindness and compassion can sometimes inspire change, even in the most unlikely people. Yes, the term thin-skinned is often used to describe someone who is overly sensitive to criticism, easily hurt, or quick to react defensively to even mild comments or disagreements. People who are thin-skinned tend to take things personally and may struggle to handle negative feedback or differing opinions. Being Thin-skinned usually means that a person has a low tolerance for criticism or negative feedback because they are more sensitive to others' opinions. This sensitivity might stem from a variety of factors, such as low self-esteem, past experiences of being judged or criticized, 
or a desire for approval. When someone is thin-skinned, even small comments or criticisms can feel like a personal attack, making them more likely to react defensively or emotionally. The reaction can also be a defense mechanism. By being overly sensitive, they may try to avoid feeling vulnerable or prevent further criticism by making it clear that they won't tolerate it. People who are thin-skinned might find it hard to separate their self-worth from what others say about them, which can lead to heightened emotional responses. Interacting on platforms like YouTube can be challenging for thin-skinned individuals due to the often harsh and critical nature of online comments and discussions. Here are a few considerations. One, emotional impact. For those who are thin-skinned, negative comments or criticism can be particularly hurtful. This can lead to stress, anxiety, or even a reluctance to engage with the community. Two, community support. On the flip side, YouTube can also offer a supportive community. There are many channels focused on positivity and constructive feedback, which can be beneficial for those who may feel vulnerable. Three, personal growth. Engaging with diverse opinions can help individuals develop thicker skin over time. Exposure to criticism in a controlled way might allow them to build resilience. Four, content creation. If they create content, it's important to prepare for mixed feedback. Setting boundaries and expectations about comments can help manage interactions better. Five, self-reflection. It's vital for individuals to assess their emotional readiness before diving into online interactions. If they feel particularly sensitive, it might be worth considering a break or finding alternative ways to engage. Ultimately, it depends on the individual's comfort level and ability to cope with potential negativity. Yes, fake positive community support can exist, especially in online spaces like YouTube and social media. Here are some characteristics and examples. One, surface level positivity. Some communities may project a positive atmosphere but lack genuine support. Members might engage in superficial compliments without offering constructive feedback or true encouragement. Two, echo chambers. In certain groups, only positive opinions may be accepted while dissenting voices are silenced. This can create an illusion of support, but it may prevent meaningful discussions or growth. Three, Toxic positivity. This refers to the belief that one should always maintain a positive mindset, regardless of circumstances. While it may seem supportive, it can invalidate feelings and discourage individuals from expressing genuine concerns or struggles. Four, influencer dynamics. Some influencers may cultivate a positive community to enhance their brand, but their support may not extend beyond their public persona. Followers might feel pressured to conform to this positivity leading to a lack of authenticity. Five, manipulative behavior. In some cases, individuals might engage in fake support for personal gain, such as seeking attention, validation, or a larger following. Their support may not be sincere and could be a tactic to manipulate others. Recognizing the difference between genuine and fake support can be challenging. It's essential to seek communities that promote honest, constructive dialogue and where individuals feel safe expressing a range of emotions. Absolutely, fake positive community support can be driven by financial motives as well. Here are some ways this can manifest. One, influencer marketing. Influencers may create a supportive community to promote products or brands. Their positive endorsements might not stem from genuine belief in the product, but rather from financial compensation. Followers may feel misled if they perceive this support as authentic. Two, membership fees. Some online communities or platforms charge fees for membership, promising exclusive support or resources. The support provided may be superficial, primarily aimed at generating income rather than fostering genuine connections. Three, affiliate marketing. Individuals might promote products through affiliate links, earning commissions for every sale made through their recommendations. They may present these products as beneficial to their community, even if they don't genuinely endorse them. Four, crowdfunding or donations. Content creators may encourage followers to support them through crowdfunding platforms or donation requests, framing it as community support. If the creator isn't transparent about how funds are used, this can create a sense of exploitation. Five, 
selling courses or workshops. Some may offer workshops, courses, or consultations under the guise of providing community support. If their motivations are primarily financial, rather than genuinely helping others, it can lead to distrust among community members. Six, create an illusion of success. People may foster a positive image of themselves to attract followers and increase their revenue streams, even if it's not an accurate reflection of reality. This can include showcasing a lifestyle that is financially unattainable for most. In these cases, the financial gain can overshadow genuine community building, leading to relationships that are more transactional than supportive. It's important for individuals to critically evaluate the motivations behind the support they receive in online communities. Yes, fake positive community support can indeed be mentally and emotionally harmful to individuals. Here are several ways this can occur. One, unrealistic expectations. When people are exposed to curated portrayals of success, happiness, or support, they may develop unrealistic expectations for their own lives. This can lead to feelings of inadequacy, anxiety, or depression when they compare themselves to these idealized versions. Two, disillusionment. Discovering that the support or positivity in a community is insincere can lead to feelings of betrayal. This disillusionment can cause individuals to withdraw from social interactions and communities, resulting in loneliness and isolation. Three, pressure to conform. In a community that promotes fake positivity, individuals might feel pressured to suppress their genuine feelings or struggles. This can lead to internal conflict and increased stress as they struggle to maintain a facade of happiness or contentment. Four, exploitation. When people realize they are being exploited for financial gain, it can lead to feelings of anger, frustration, and helplessness. This realization can erode trust not just in the specific community, but in social interactions more broadly. Five, stigmatization of vulnerability. If a community emphasizes only positive experiences and discourages discussions about challenges or failures, individuals may feel stigmatized for expressing vulnerability. This can prevent them from seeking help or sharing their struggles. Six, dependency on validation. Individuals who rely on external validation from such communities may experience emotional turmoil when that validation is withdrawn or found to be insincere. This dependency can undermine their self-esteem and sense of worth. Seven, negative cycle of comparison. Continuous exposure to curated positive portrayals can trigger a cycle of comparison leading individuals to feel worse about their own lives, which can exacerbate mental health issues. Eight, community fragmentation. If individuals perceive insincerity within the community, it can lead to fragmentation, creating an environment where members distrust each other. This can hinder the sense of belonging that communities are meant to provide. Ultimately, it's essential for individuals to cultivate awareness and critical thinking when engaging with online communities seeking genuine connections, and being mindful of the motivations behind community dynamics can help mitigate the potential mental health impacts of fake positive support. Yes, many of the negative effects of fake positive community support can be kept unconscious or may not be immediately recognized by individuals. Here are some ways this can occur. One, subconscious beliefs. People may develop subconscious beliefs about their self-worth and societal expectations based on the curated portrayals they encounter online. These beliefs can influence their emotions and behaviors without their conscious awareness. Two, repression of feelings. Individuals might unconsciously repress negative feelings or experiences to align with the perceived norms of a positive community. This repression can lead to unresolved issues that manifest as anxiety or depression later on. Three, denial of reality. Some individuals may deny the negative aspects of their experiences or the insincerity of the community, opting instead to focus on the positive portrayals they encounter. This denial can prevent them from addressing underlying issues. Ma four, social conditioning. Cultural and social conditioning can lead individuals to accept fake positivity as normal. This acceptance can happen unconsciously, making it challenging for them to recognize when they are experiencing harm. Five, avoidance of discomfort. 
Engaging with a positive community may provide temporary relief from discomfort or negative emotions. This can create a pattern of avoidance where individuals seek out positive reinforcement without acknowledging the complexities of their feelings. Six, cognitive dissonance. Individuals might experience cognitive dissonance when their lived experiences contradict the positive narratives they see online. This dissonance can create an uncomfortable internal conflict that individuals might not fully confront. Seven, blind spots in self-reflection. When individuals engage with fake positive support, they may lack the self-awareness needed to reflect critically on their feelings and experiences. This lack of insight can result in a blind spot regarding the community's impact on their mental health. Eight, unconscious habits. People may develop unconscious habits of seeking validation from these communities, often without realizing the detrimental effects it has on their self-esteem and mental health. Nine, impact of trauma. For some individuals, past traumas may affect their perception of community support. They might unconsciously seek out environments that reinforce their trauma responses, making it difficult to recognize healthier dynamics. 10, normalization of toxicity. When individuals repeatedly engage with toxic positivity, it can become normalized. They may not recognize the harmful aspects because they are so accustomed to the environment. In summary, many people may not consciously recognize the negative impact of fake positive community support on their mental health and well-being. It often requires self-reflection, critical thinking, and sometimes professional help to uncover these unconscious patterns and beliefs. If someone is on dialysis and has no functioning kidneys, they typically do not pee at all or pee very little. Dialysis, whether hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, works to remove excess fluid and waste from the blood, which kidneys would normally do. Without functioning kidneys, the body produces significantly less or no urine because the kidneys are what create urine by filtering waste and excess fluid from the blood. So to directly answer your question, if Rob the Waxed is on dialysis due to having no kidneys, he likely doesn't pee faster or slower. He may not be urinating at all, or only producing minimal amounts of urine. Yes, people on dialysis still poop. Dialysis replaces some of the kidney functions, like filtering waste and balancing fluids, but it does not affect the digestive system directly. The colon and digestive tract remain functional, and the process of digestion and waste elimination through bowel movements continues as normal. However, dialysis patients might experience changes in bowel habits due to diet changes, medications, or the effects of their illness. Some may have constipation or diarrhea, depending on their specific medical situation. Starbucks coffee, or any coffee in general, can potentially help with bowel movements due to its caffeine content. Caffeine is a natural stimulant that can promote muscle contractions in the colon, which may lead to an urge to poop. However, the effects of coffee vary among individuals. For dialysis patients specifically, consuming coffee should be approached with caution. Here's why. One, fluid intake. Dialysis patients often have to monitor their fluid intake and coffee counts towards that limit. Two, potassium levels. Coffee contains some potassium, which can be a concern for people on dialysis if consumed in large quantities. Three, phosphorus additives. Some coffee products or flavors might contain phosphorus additives which are generally restricted for dialysis patients. For those not on dialysis but dealing with constipation, moderate coffee consumption can potentially aid digestion. Always consult with a healthcare provider for personalized advice. You're welcome. If you have any more questions or need further assistance, feel free to ask.